Welcome back to RSA Conference 2021, live from Virtual Broadcast Alley. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for the segment is Wayne Haber. He is Director of Engineering at GitLab. Wayne, welcome to Security Weekly. Hey, man, how are you? Very good. You want to talk about transparency, and I think we're going to talk about transparency in a couple ways here. One is company transparency, but I'm also interested about, you know, transparency internally for organizations as well because as we we see with devops and security and devsecops transparency collaboration all important aspects of making sure we have secure coding practices in place let's start with some of the transparency that gitlab has been doing uh in in your like corporate life <laughs> sure sure so so um, I was at a security company for quite a while before I came to GitLab about uh, two years ago. And initially, I was shocked at the level of transparency. I knew that going in, but then living it is very different. Is We are transparent internally about th most things that most companies would not be, and also externally. So we have, um, you know, it's an open source product. Um, it's also our, uh, so that we have a lot of transparency around that, but also our company handbook and how we operate is completely open on the internet. Um, we not only um, let anybody contribute to it in order to um, improve it, uh, with approvers, of course, but also um, uh, we encourage that from the public as well, which is great. So you can see how we pr uh, process security incidents, how we test our own code for security, the company org chart is there, and um, that transparency really makes us extremely efficient and effective as a company, and it's also really, really inclusive, so everybody really can contribute. And um, there are a couple challenges with it, you know, occasionally, but uh, the benefits far outweigh the negatives. Well, I mean, we, we know the challenges in the space after supply chain attacks in the market, right? And what I think is interesting is when you take a very transparent approach, hopefully your your software is not in the news because everybody knows exactly how you're handling security, kind of what your policies around security and privacy are, and all the things that maybe a commercial company doesn't do or, or may not do. It, it's, I think, a breath of fresh air when we think about that, knowing all the things that we've been you know uncovering over the past few months. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give an example of how we're different in terms of how we use our own things and how we operate. So if they're, you know, we use bug bounty programs. Uh, I think we use uh, Hacker One, for example, and uh, we're not the top pair on bug bounties on Hacker One, but but pretty close to the top. I believe in the top ten. So we sp we really want to get people's feedback, and we give them access to the code. We give them at we let them scan our, you know, uh, scan our hosted uh, solutions, etc., and then when security issues are found, when we use our own security solutions, which we dog food ourselves, we use our own software for security to protect our, our own stuff. It's the same things that we give to customers like security scanning of the code, secret scanning, container scanning, et cetera. Um, once the issue is found, whether it's by us or by the bug bounty program, pen testers that we hire, we um, document it internally. Anybody at the company can see the security issues we're working on. Hmm. And that brings so much um, collaboration and feedback and making sure that it, it speeds the time to resolve the issues and it also speeds the or increases the level of um of surety that we've actually solved it and things like it very different than what i was used to at previous companies and we do a great job of that and then once that security issue is resolved and we tell customers about it um, so they can patch if they need to if they're running our self-hosted version we then often make the details public so all of our discussions about the issue all of our you know pull requests or merge requests in gitlab uh, terminology um on the changes and we get feedback sometimes we didn't fix things completely and we get feedback from the community so we can fully fix them and really understand it and it really it, it's the, the level of collaboration and the level of inclusiveness to get a lot of people's feedback really improves things and it's just uh, refreshing yeah, and, and I think as people really try to figure out how to solve supply chain risk, having transparency from people that are actually in their supply chain, because if you think about what GitLab does, right, people are using your CICD pipeline technologies to build their software to put in into uh, their applications into the cloud, deploy wherever. And when you think about that for a second, I mean, you are a critical part of that supply chain. 
And when we think about security, sometimes we don't think about securing the CI CD process. I mean, we, we, Paul and I talk about this all the time because, you know, we have our own pipeline process and we need to secure it better. But if somebody like GitLab is really on top of securing it and making it transparent to you, that takes a little pressure off of aspects, maybe not everything, but a good chunk of aspects about how do you secure that, that supply chain? Yeah. And we use our own solutions that we that we make part of our commercial product to secure our own. And so I was a customer of GitLab before I worked at GitLab and I saw how well it worked because at the previous company I was at, and it's very common is you have spots. So you have a solution for scanning the code with SAS. You have a solution for doing web app scanning. You have a solution for dependency checking for secret scanning, which is, which is separate, et cetera. And the developers, hate those things when they're separate, in my opinion. <laughs> and because they got to go into something else, they have to, there's something else to implement, there's something else to keep track of. So since we have really good solutions that do the whole DevOps life, DevOps life cycle, from a developer's perspective, we put those security issues right in front of the developers at the time they can resolve them. Right. They can then, um, you know, submit a, uh, submit a, a merge request to see a build run and see if it actually resolves it. Um, and verify it. So it puts it right there in the same tool the developers use, which the developers really like, um, which is great to get adoption. Because often you have spot solutions for each individual part, the developers won't use them, and it's the security team or the CISO team chasing after the development teams rather than having a real partnership there to. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. if we think about internal transparency, the ability to integrate security into the pipeline and making that visible, transparent, like instantly available to the developers is what the whole concept of shift left is about, right? I mean, it's the ability for as you're moving through the pipeline and you're doing builds and you're scanning them and you're looking for your dependencies and all the fun things that happen in that pipeline, making it actionable, like at the time you discover it, that's improving the overall security of the application. And to your point, you know, we've seen a lot of transformation in the application security space, right? Where the, the, the security players finally realized that they had to bring the tools to the developers, that the developers weren't going to log into the tools. And so by you guys having a lot of those integrated already into the pipeline, you make it a lot easier to manage the end to end process. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's, I've seen it work where I worked previously, and I see it work for ourselves as well. And again, we get a lot of great feedback from our customers where have, that they integrate that. And of course, customers don't need to make their security issues internally transparent in order to use our solutions. That's something we do ourselves, but yeah. I think it really helps. Um, and um, since we're also, um, we operate in, in 67 countries and 1,300 employees um, and zero offices, uh, which we've, we've done that since the beginning, all that collaboration being asynchronous, so um, it, often in writing, we do. Uh, we often record our meetings very, very often, and often they'll have that on YouTube by intent, publicly, so people can see how we operate. Um, they can see how we do things. We get feedback that way. We get a lot of trust with our customers, with our community of open source contributors. We also, um, one thing I didn't realize, is it actually ends up being a recruiting tool. People have told me, hmm. wait, I joined your team because I was able to watch your staff meeting. For the last two staff meetings, on YouTube and just see what the people are like and see what you like. And you know, that's great. I think this is a great learning lesson for how to build a really good security culture, especially between development and security. It's a struggle still for a lot of organizations. You know, the security teams looked at the, the team of no, you can't do that. Or the team that's going to slow down development or deployment because they've got to go run all their checks over here. But when you can bring that in, to the development cycle. Think about the culture you're creating in those organizations where development and security see the exact same things in the exact same places, and you're not slowing down the development pipeline. That, that's a huge advantage and creates a really good culture that organizations struggle with. So I think this is a really good roadmap for others to think about if they really want to build true security culture in their organizations. Absolutely agree. And you're, you're talking about the, uh, culture of no or you know um, that's often how the security teams and CISO teams are seen as as an impediment to progress and it you know completely integrating the process really helps with that um, it also helps to 
if an organization is not transparent internally and doesn't have these things integrated, is to start small and iteratively implement it. You know, perhaps make security issues that are low risk available internally at the company to get more feedback on them and more collaboration on them. Show the value, show how they resolve faster, and then slowly increase the risk levels if an organization is not already doing that in order to show the value on time to resolve and the value in you know the completeness of the solution because um it's one thing to theoretically consider those things and think about them but i've really seen it happen um, where we use our own tools to do that's that. great yeah I, I, there's one other angle i wanted to touch on just briefly we, you know there have been a lot of Outside of the the main supply chain attack, which which is in the news, we've also seen some very interesting research being done on open source projects, right? Where we've got a lot of vulnerabilities that have been sitting in legacy open source products um, for a while, and there are dependencies in other other operating systems or or whatever. Um, I, I want to, you know, you guys spend a lot of time, I think you know, having your code tested and making that available. And I think that's another really interesting part because when we look at some of these older open source components that have a lot of technical debt because they have a lot of history or they don't have a lot of contributors to them and therefore they can't continue to stay on top of the security aspects, it creates a lot of vulnerabilities later. I think you guys have also done a really good job it, from this perspective, being really transparent, having the, the contributors and, and making the changes to continually improve and secure your open source project, which we don't necessarily see in other open source projects. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And, um, you know, we use, um, Dependency checking, we've automated dependency checking to look at that part of the supply chain. We can also scan containers for missing patches and misconfigurations, et cetera. And we use that ourselves as well as, as part of the product. And it really does help to automate that, to scan for those. And then it also can help to, um, as you're automating these, to make, as you said, to make it transparent, but also taking um, feedback from the community. So an example is, uh, one of my teams developed a new feature, uh, one of my engineering teams, and um, it was a new developer and they introduced a security bug. Hmm. Uh, it was a stored cross-site scripting bug. It was hard, it was hard to exploit, but it, it was definitely still there. And we missed it, our scanning missed it, but our bug bounty program, somebody caught it. Hmm. Um, and we thanked them for it. Uh, we paid them a bounty. We fixed it pretty quickly. We told our customers about it. And then we learned from it. We were iteratively improving saying, hey, we use this kind of field in the Ruby code rather than that kind of field that did the validation. Um, so let's scan all our other code and let's train the team, mm -hmm. especially the new developers that handle that. And it was a great experience for both us and I think also for the bug bounty person. Yeah, and I think that's a great lesson learned because you learned from the bug bounty, you updated your testing process to go not only validate that fix, but then run that against all my other code, all my other legacy code that's already been out there and make sure that that vulnerability doesn't exist anywhere else, right? And and that's a testament to how open source security should really run at the end of the day, is that continual feedback, that continual testing improvement to make the, the source code that much more secure. Absolutely, and yet the other key part um, is to make the root cause analysis, the RCAs, whether it's outages or security issues, blameless. Don't blame the people. Make it safe for the people who are involved to contribute and discuss. It's blame the processes and the technologies are in place so it can be improved. And we do a lot of that uh, as well. And that really, really helps. Um, it's it's very inclusive and it really helps to improve things overall. Yeah. And that's a great leader. Yeah. That's a great leadership lesson, right? Because if it's the blame game, guess what? The next guy or gal is not going to speak up and, and get that issue fixed. And, and, you know, when the leadership believes in that transparency and that inclusiveness and doesn't blame people for things, but has a process that allows you to fix it quickly and improve from that, that's a great way to think about security. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. Thanks, Matt. Have a great day. If anybody wants to learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash GitLab. And with that, we're going to take a quick break, but don't worry, we'll be back with more micro interviews today. <laughs> 